Hey, this is Andy Hill from the Marriage, Kids, and Money podcast, and when I'm not singing Disney karaoke songs with my kids at home, I'm stacking Benjamins. Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's the Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and today we're tossing everything else aside so we can focus on what's important, you. That's right, we're answering your letters today. We'll tackle a note from Jared, who finds himself at a crossroads with his financial advisor. With less than stellar results, is it time to give his advisor the boot? We'll also say hello to Andrew, who's wondering about small company stocks. He's heard that these investments have outperformed other types of investments. We'll answer tons more, throw out the Haven Lifeline, endure a rant from Joe, what else is new, and still leave some time for the trivia master himself, that's right, me! And now, two guys who are huddled around their microphones ready to make some magic, it's Joe and oh, j j j j j Mom would get angry if we started a campfire here on the floor in the middle of the basement. Smoke detectors might go off. But then we get a nice warm rain. It's better than being here in the freezing, freezing cold. My feet are freezing. I did, I did notice you're wearing like your big uh, grandpa jacket. I do. I have my Mr. Roger sweater on underneath it. Yeah. So I am ready to go. Hey, everybody. Welcome to podcasting in the winter for the win. I'm Joe Salci. I average Joe Money on Twitter and across the card table on a Wednesday. It's my good friend, the other guy, or as we refer to him, OG. At not the fake OG on Twitter. Not the fake one. What's up, dude? Just trying not to... Uh, Chilling like a villain? Not to notice that my feet are freezing. And look at these, by the way. These slippers. Have I shown you these slippers before that I got when we were in Alaska? Look at how thick the, those the things ones with are. The ones uh, they got the big bear claws on the end. That's cute. They got the, No, they do not have big bear claws on the end. That would be neat, though, wouldn't it? Pink fluffy bunny slippers. Nice. Good touch. Well, you know, somebody's got to. It puts a smile on people's faces when they come down to the basement. It also is great in uh, job interviews. Wear your bunny slippers to your job interview. Hello, my lady. Or tuxedo, like in Step Brothers. Thanks to LinkedIn, by the way, for supporting Stacky Benjamins. Making that perfect hire, somebody with bunny slippers, can help set your team up for success. That's the first sign I've heard of success. If they have bunny slippers, it shows self-confidence. I mean, just it think does. about it. You're right. Yep. And no emotion. The right hire can make a huge impact on your business. A new hire is made every 10 seconds on LinkedIn. Go to linkedin.com slash SB and you know what's going to happen? You're going to get $50 off your first job post. Terms and conditions apply. You know, maybe the better strategy would be with so many people coming through the door at LinkedIn, you can easily X out the people who wear bunny slippers. You can tell a little bit more about them from their LinkedIn profile ahead of time. Thanks to Grammarly also for supporting Stacky Benjamins. We talked about this last week, OG, but Grammarly says, I know all the words. More than 99% of the people out there, they tell me that uh, my vocabulary is bigger. Thanks to Grammarly. Grammarly is a communication tool that helps people improve their writing to be mistake-free, clear, and effective. It can help you expand your vocabulary so you can be more like me when it comes to your vocabulary. Start writing confidently by going to Grammarly.com slash SB to get 20% off a Grammarly premium account today. I love how you just stare at me while I, while I do that. I wish that Grammarly had like an audio version where it could like take, take a conversation because I feel like when I talk off the microphone, I have a much more verbose vocabulary robust yes i think you're pretty verbose even even in your writing you're pretty verbose okay thank you and you're also fairly explicit in your writing are you just you're just saying these words to get another check mark somewhere and concise <laughs> <laughs> we're not being very concise we got to get the show going man we got you in the driver's seat today because we're taking your letters. OG's fired up. We've got some great uh, headlines. So let's uh, get in here and do it. Hello, darlings. 
And now, it's time for your favorite part of the show, our Stacking Benjamin's Headlines. First headline comes to us from MLive.com. One of our Michigan listeners sent this to me. Financial advisor, advisors in quotes. You always know it's going to be a bad piece when it says financial advisor and the word advisor is separated by by quotes. Gets more than seven years for stealing $300,000 from a 97-year-old. Is there like a special place in hell for people that steal from 97-year-olds? That's pretty weak. I mean, if you're going to steal money, you got to steal it, you know, right? <laughs> you're looking at me like, wait a second. <laughs> Where is this going? Yeah. Yeah. Have some balls. Steal from a 40 year old. Yeah. Yeah. If you're going to, I mean, like uh, the mob or something, you know, try to steal from, to steal from the mob if you're going to steal money. I got a great idea. Bank. If you really think you're a thief, get a bunch of your friends together that are good in different things, head to the Bellagio and uh, try to steal from the Bellagio. There you go. You know, go bigger, go home. They should make a movie. That's about that plot sometime. Maybe. I think that might go over big. Send it in. Send it in. A Warner man, Brothers. A man convicted of stealing more than... Maybe you should have... Ooh, I already know. George Clooney. Perfect. I think he I'm would... Gonna, I'm casting George Clooney. He would rock in that role. I mean, just just yeah. imagine... If he was like the ringleader. And you'd have Andy Garcia run the casino. How great would that be? Yeah. like a, He's kind of like a bad guy. Yeah. But he's somebody you don't want to trifle with. Brilliant. Right. You got to have some love interest. Fantastic. So we'll think of that here as we go on. Well, let's see what, what's up with this uh, financial All right, quote. What did this advisor. loser do? Mm. This is uh, Muskegon County, Michigan. A man convicted of stealing more than $300,000 from an elderly widow he met at his phony financial planning seminar. Oh, it was a phony seminar. That's even better. We'll spend at least seven and a half years in prison. Gary Edward Duke Haynes, 58, of Comstock Park, was convicted by a jury in December of eight counts of embezzlement from a vulnerable adult, four counts of failing to file his income taxes and running a criminal enterprise. Oh, boy. Muskegon County Circuit Judge Annette Smedley. Isn't that a great judge name? You're going up in front of Judge Annette Smedley. The other Smedley I know is uh, from Marine Corps history, Smedley Butler. Mm Mm-hmm. Was awarded the Medal of Honor twice. So on uh, February eighth, Judge Medley sentenced Haynes to between seven and a half and twenty years in prison for embezzlement of a hundred thousand dollars or more and the criminal enterprise charge. He received thirty months to five years for the remaining charges, which will run concurrent to the longer sentence. In a letter to the court, Haynes' ninety-seven-year-old victim described the devastation of his crimes, including isolation, loss of confidence, financial desperation, and fear of retaliation from Haynes. Quote, I trusted Duke too much, and now I can't trust anyone, she wrote. The case was brought by the Office of Michigan's Attorney General. It was alleged that Haynes met the victim in 2006 at a financial planning seminar he led and served as her agent for 10 years. When she met him, she asked Haynes, this is where the problem started, OG. When she met him, she asked Haynes to help her pay her bills online and gave him access to her computer, financial accounts, and passwords, according to the Attorney General's office. Mm-hmm. Please don't do that. Yeah, that's a really tough thing because obviously there's places and there's people who actually do that and do that well, right? You think about like family offices, the guy who owns, I was going to say Starbucks, but he's pretty popular these days. But, you know, he doesn't sit down and pay his electric bill. He has a he has a whole team of people that do that. But I think that's the biggest difference is that there's a lot of checks and balances there. There's not one person who comes over to his house and sits on his couch and opens his laptop and does it. It's it's a whole team of people. So my mother, unless you've got billions of dollars, do not give people your passwords. And I can see older people getting frustrated. My mother-in-law doesn't work online at all, uh, has no interest in the computer. And everywhere she goes, she was just mentioning this last week. She gets really frustrated because people go, Oh, just go to our website. Oh, just, just, just use our automated thing. And she's like, I don't use the automated thing. Oh, um, Hmm. And so she's really coming at odds, getting some basic things done because she's not online. During testimony at Haynes' preliminary examination, the woman said she moved to the Fruitport area from Arizona. That's on the west side of Michigan in 2005. Aside from a cleaning lady who also took her on errands, the woman said she didn't have local friends or family who she saw regularly. You could just Hmm. hear the loneliness. I talked to Haynes about handling my affairs because I had no one and I didn't know anyone here, she testified. 
Haynes had taken the woman's money from her account and transferred it to bank accounts belonging to his two companies, Senior Planning Resource and Future by Design. <laughs> future by Design was one of the names of his companies. My future. My future. And I'm designing it with your money. <laughs> it is incredible. He had told the woman some of the money would be invested in annuities in her name, but it never was. He took more than $300,000 over four years, documents show. In her letter to the court, Haim's victim explained that before her husband died in 2001, they'd invested in an annuity that would allow her to, quote, live a better life as I grew older. According to a state document, Haynes allegedly was successful in coercing the woman to liquidate a $107,735 annuity and place the funds in a bank account that he controlled. He then invested the funds in a risky and illiquid house flipping venture, according to the notice of intent to revoke Haynes investment advisor representative registration. Haynes registration was revoked by the state and the Department of Licensing and Regulatory Affairs fined him $10,000 last April. So he did have, he did have a license to practice. Mm -hmm. Still criminal. I consider myself a strong, independent woman, not afraid of anything. The victim wrote. Now I hear things in the night that wake me. I'm afraid of car slowing, rolling by my house, car door slamming. I don't know if Duke or someone Duke would send would hurt me. Uh, It just, it it gets worse and worse. Handing over all your passwords to your financial accounts, unless it's a big, well-established company, checks and balances, insurance that you can look at against problems. Yeah. I mean, if you're, uh, (laughs) you wouldn't enter into this relationship at age 85. You know what I mean? Like you would have already been doing this for the last 35 years. There's a lot of ways to kind of insulate yourself against this. One of the biggest things is to make sure not only do you not give away user IDs and passwords, of course, but make sure that when you get the statements that you get them, you know, this is now an evolving issue also in the advisor business. We used to be able to, you know, Joe, if you were a client, you could call me and say, Hey, by the way, I changed my email address. Can you change it for me? Yeah, no problem. But now because people use their email address like an actual mailing address, we can't change email addresses on our on our custodial records uh, unless you do it directly yourself. So if you're going to have other people handle your money for you, you have to verify it. You have to look at the statement. It's, it's so difficult. Our second piece uh, comes to us from the Omaha World Herald. You found this. The Omaha, you, you're reading all over the place, man. The Omaha World Herald. I do what I can. This is a uh, first part of a series called How to Wreck a Pension Fund. OPS is $771 million pension shortfall, a product of, quote, mind-boggling mistakes, World Herald investigation shows. As the nation fell deep into the Great Recession in 2008, Omaha's Warren Buffett urged calm, assuring Americans that blue-chip companies plunging stocks were sure to eventually ride high again. But the trustees and administrator overseeing the Omaha Public Schools Pension Fund didn't listen to the hometown investment sage. They bailed heavily on the stock market. Then they put most of the pension fund's assets into a growing list of non-traditional, often speculative investment alternatives, among them real estate in Mumbai, India, international shipping, Ukrainian agriculture, oil companies in Kazakhstan and Brazil, timberlands in Tennessee, distressed housing in Florida, New Jersey, Nevada, and more. And in the process, they transformed one of the nation's best performing pension funds into one of the worst. Not only did the pension fund largely miss the stock market's strong rebound, but the trustees also did a poor job of choosing the new investments with many actually losing money. All the investment blunders cost the fund hundreds of millions of dollars and are now exacting a toll on the education of the more than 50,000 children in the state's largest school district. The World Herald recently looked into the roots of a massive $771 million shortfall in the troubled OPS pension fund. The financial black hole is forcing the district that educates more of Nebraska's poor children than any other to slash spending to meet mandated obligations to its retirees. The investigation revealed much mismanagement by the fund's trustees made up of the OPS superintendent, three school board members, a pair of local businessmen, three science teachers, and a district plumber. Are you kidding me? (laughs) No. And then the piece says exactly what I was thinking. Not one investment professional among them. Few pension funds in the country sold off more stock or bet more heavily on investments outside traditional stocks and bonds. 
this is a terrible lesson and th- and it goes on i mean this is a expose piece that is a couple of uh, parts long but it goes on to kind of detail out some of the fallacies i think that happened during that time and of course with no professional guidance along the way and <laughs> you read the list of the board members there wasn't anyone to back test it one of the things that the uh Uh, or backstop it, I should say, there was a part where the newspaper was saying, well, show us the due diligence that you did on your Ukrainian shipping liner business that you decided to buy into. No one had seen anything. No one had a record of it. It was like literally anybody could show up with any idea. There's a quote in there, and I can't find exactly where it is. It might have been in the other parts. But but basically, they wanted mid-teen returns with less volatility than stocks. Okay, that doesn't exist in real life. There is a very noticeable trade-off between volatility and expected return. If there was no volatility, then there could be no expected return, right? That's what you trade away when you buy equities, is you trade away the, the, the known tomorrow for a possibility of a better return in the future, but you could have a minus 20 somewhere in there, right? And so that's the, that's the thing that you trade away. It's interesting that they were very, you know, markets timing centric to kind of start getting out of the, out of stocks, like in the late 2007 and early 2008, but then never got back in, you know, I mean, I don't agree with the getting out part to begin with, but I can understand that people's emotions get the best of them. And you just start seeing the market go down you see the market go down, you see the market go down and finally go, we're in charge of billions of dollars here, guys, we got to do something. At first, I thought I saw the strategy as I was reading this. We're going to bail out of the stock market because things are going poorly. And then I read these, this list of non-traditional investments. And I said, okay, they thought they were losing so much money that they were going to actually increase the beta and increase the standard deviation to use modern portfolio theory. They're actually going to try to ride the upswing quicker by using these non-traditional asset like bounce classes. Bounce off the bottom. Yes, And I've seen people do that before. And obviously, to your point, bam, that is an incredibly risky strategy. It's an incredibly risky strategy. Yeah, you're trying to double down and just get it over with and go, yeah, we're going to crash this thing as quickly as we can so we can rebound twice as fast as everybody else. And it it becomes this gambler mentality. I mean, when you start talking about investments in Kazakhstan, you have this little (laughs) bit of gambler thing going on. I just wish I was in the meeting for that or any meeting like this where, you know, you just kind of sit back and go, wait a second, we're putting, hold on, this is supposed to pay teachers, right? For now until the end of time. Why in God's name would we buy, buy in Kazakhstanian farming land? <laughs> you know, who's selling this stuff? Who came to them and said, Hey guys, I heard you're looking for some alternative investments. I've got an alternative <laughs> for you. It's an investment in my pocket. The commission's only 42%. Because you know, there's that, that's the other part of the story that's not really here is the swindlers that got their claws into this group in advance. But, you know, I think there's a lesson here too. And if you really want to read this, you know, we'll obviously we'll have it on the show notes, uh, both sections of it. But the uh, the lesson here, I think, is when it comes to your money that you're in charge of, you can't just simply say, I'll never do anything irrational because these people were actually thinking that they were doing the right thing. Like they actually sat, they they were thinking all the time we are doing the right thing. And there wasn't anybody there who stood by and said, no, we're not getting out of stocks now. Like this is the time we should be doubling down into stocks we had 20 years of great market returns because, or great pension returns because of stocks. And there wasn't anybody who could do that. And if a big, giant, billions of dollar pension fund can do it, individuals do it. And we see it in the, in the aggregate when we look at like the JP Morgan Guide to the Markets. When that comes out every quarter, we can look at that and say, well, where did the money go? There wasn't anybody on Christmas Eve, you or me included, who sat down and said, you know, it'd be a great idea. Market just got its face kicked in today, Christmas Eve, half day trading. On Friday, it got beat senseless as well. We're down 15, 16, 18%, 19%. Internationals are down 30. You know what I should do right now? I should leverage my house, go double 2X S&P fund. 
That's what I should do. I should borrow money from my credit cards at 0% interest, do a balance transfer check to myself and get this in the market, baby. Cause, cause this is where nobody said that. If you remember, I mean, it's only eight weeks ago, right? We were on the verge of another recession, according to everyone. Everyone said that. What happened since then? Market's gone straight up. Number one underperformer last year is the number one performer this year. But when you look at inflows, when you look at where did money go, most people put their money in cash this last month. All the wrong places. Most people in December took their money out of stocks and put it into fixed income or cash after the damage was already done. So in a short moment like that, like just Christmas Eve till present, if nobody out there was screaming from the bell towers of dump money in the market, I'm a great market timer, you're sure as heck not going to be able to do it the next time. And there's no way, there's no way to tell that today's not the top. That might be the case. I don't know. I don't, I don't know what to say here besides this is a terribly unfortunate situation for all these folks in Nebraska, but man, this is, this is a strong lesson of behavioral investment planning and nobody can foresee the future, no matter how good, no matter how smart you are. In just a second, we'll have our, we'll have our big takeaways from these two headlines we know that the right hire can make a huge impact on your business. Oh, gee, you've been hiring people and it is frustrating when you hire the wrong person. But when you hire somebody who's awesome, like I'll give you an example. I hired my assistant, Tina, back when I was a financial planner, right after I'd hired somebody else. And within three weeks, we knew it was a wrong fit. It took me maybe four months to extricate myself from the wrong person hired Tina, learned a lot from my lessons, but still I was nervous because, you know, who knew if Tina was going to be a great hire or not, that ended up working out. And Tina and I worked together for a long, long, long time when I was a, when I was a financial planner, a, our clients liked her B, she was easy to work with C, she was no nonsense, no drama, love what she did, gave a ton at work. When she was done with the day, she went home and enjoyed her time with her family. It was, it was just, it was great all the way around. And that's why it's so important for you to find the right person. Here's the question though, and this didn't exist back then, but where do you find that individual? You can post a job on a job board and hope that the right person will find a job. But how often do you hang out on job boards? Don't leave finding someone great to chance. LinkedIn is the place where people go every day to make connections, grow their career and discover job opportunities most LinkedIn members haven't recently visited the top job boards, but nine out of 10 members are open to new opportunities. And with 70% of the U.S. workforce on LinkedIn, posting on LinkedIn is the best way to get your job opportunity in front of more of the right people. You'll find people who are qualified for your role and are ready for something new. Every 10 seconds, somebody gets hired using LinkedIn. Hurry to linkedin.com slash SB and you'll get $50 off your first job post. That's linkedin.com slash SB to get $50 off your first job post. LinkedIn.com slash SB terms and conditions apply. I think our takeaways, number one, this idea of giving somebody your passwords still just absolutely puts a pit in my stomach that she gave this gentleman her passwords to manage the money. But I think, I think a bigger takeaway OG is look for those statements from the annuity companies or whatever, the investment companies that the advisor is working with. So, you know, they're actually professional companies that you've worked with before had this advisor put the money in an annuity. Like he said, he was going to, it would be on an annuity. Yeah. You would have gotten a statement from Prudential or something. Eventually. Yeah. Would have, would have had that. I think that's the takeaway. And then the second takeaway is uh, if you're running, running a $2 million, $200 million, $2 billion, $2 billion pension fund, you might want to have an investment professional or two help you with how modern portfolio theory works at the very least. I think that could have avoided a lot of these problems.
We love today's show because the special guest, the guest of honor is you. It's time for us to work on emptying out the mailbag at least a little bit. And uh, we're going to start off with this one Doug has on top. That's from Andrew. Andrew said, I've heard the argument that investing in small cap value stocks has historically returned more than the broad market. Which, <laughs> the argument. You mean the science and data and academic research? Which makes sense if you hold shares in individual stocks. However, since this style of investing is largely accomplished by investing in mutual funds or ETFs, wouldn't these vehicles be required to sell any stock that have price appreciation to the point of no longer being considered small cap or value and then replacing that stock with other companies that were on the downtrend falling out of the mid cap range in order to meet their investing objectives. I got it. I follow what he's saying. Yeah. I've heard the converse of this argument as a positive for investing in S and P 500 funds as these funds naturally sell off losers when those companies follow the S and P 500 and replace them with companies that are on the uptrend. So wouldn't this mean that small cap value funds, ETFs are always holding stocks that don't see price or PE change selling winners and buying losers leading to poor performance overall. Haven't learned anything from your show yet, but I believe there's always a first for everything. And I'm hoping this question can provide that first for me. Thanks. Thank you for the question, Andrew. Let's uh, let's take that one because science and data shows that while Andrew makes some sense of his argument here, that um, that hasn't been the case. Well, I think you're missing a big component of this, which is there are certainly companies that are created every single day that also start out as small companies that grow all the way through the cycle. Just because a company has changed its market cap does not necessarily mean that it's gone down in value or as a loser. There is no correlation between if to be a successful company, you've got to go from small to mid to large. That's not a progression of company growth, right? It's it's all about profitability and earnings and that sort of thing. You could be the smallest widget maker for an iPhone, but if you have a ton of profitability, you know, you'd still be a great a great investment. The other thing that I think is important to note is that while it's true that uh, fund managers are buying and selling different things, I doubt that it has anything to do with winners and losers and rather is their normal mechanism of rebalancing. Just like different asset classes perform at different rates, real estate does better than big companies, big companies do better than international. You know, it's just it's just random. Also within those subsets, different companies are going to have different cycles. Discretionary consumer companies may do better than consumer staples companies, for example, during a period of time. And so through normal rebalancing, even within that core group of 2,000 positions, you're taking advantage of of the normal swings within the economy. Well, he's talking about these these passive indexes. Yeah, but passive indexes are nothing more than a list of companies put together by another company and licensed. So the small cap index, somebody might say it's the Russell 2000. Well, Russell's the investment company that puts together the list of 1,837 companies that belong in the Russell 2000. And they still rebel. And then they send that list, list out to everybody. Gotcha. Yeah. You know, and I also think about how slowly those companies die versus how quickly upstart companies succeed. I'm thinking about the fact that I I read just last week that that Movie Pass was finally delisted. Did you see that? Yeah, that was a yeah, there long. There goes that ten thousand option call contract for t- five <laughs> years from now. That was a long, long, long slow death for that company. And at the same time, there's probably been many companies on the other side in the same space, same size, that are rocket ships. Um, well, I think this just goes back to the same, like we were talking about before. There is no progression of small to big means it's better. They're just different. And if you get, quote, kicked out of the S&P 500, that doesn't mean that you're a bad company or that you're not good. It just means that they're changing the weighting in that. They took companies out of the Dow Jones just because it didn't represent the kind of the way the economy was anymore. You know, I can't remember what the last one was that they took out, but I remember thinking like, you know, that was a big industrial company from, you know, the 40s and 50s. And replace it, like it Caterpillar with- or something, you know, and put Apple in instead. It didn't mean that whatever company they took out was a bad company. It just meant that it didn't represent what they were trying to but if it's the illustrate. S- but if it's the S&P 500, it is the 500 biggest companies in the United States. And then it is a market cap thing. 
and the market cap's not as big as some other company that overcame it. But does that does that mean that your company sucks? No, it definitely doesn't have to do that. So you're right. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're a bad company. Thanks for the question, Andrew. Next question comes to us from Craig. Craig says, hey, guys, my wife and I just inherited $50,000. We're both 30 with only a mortgage and debt. What would you recommend we do with the money? Thanks always for your help, even though I don't learn anything. Craig, that is easy. Make the check out to the Charitable Association for Show Hosts. Uh, and you can just take that and use the acronym CASH and uh, address that to the basement here, and we're good. That's that's the investment that keeps giving. The easiest one. Well, you know, it didn't give us a lot to go on here. We have no idea what your financial goals are. We don't know what you've done already as it relates to financial or investment planning. No idea what your cash situation is. So I'll just assume that you have done none of that. And I'll tell you what I think. I think you should put a good chunk of it in cash and have you fill up your cash reserve to whatever number is satisfactory to you. Three to six months probably is adequate in expenses Second thing I would do would be to fund last year and this year's Roth IRAs for both you and your spouse, assuming that you're able to do that. That would account for roughly another 23000 of it. And uh, you probably pretty much spent it all after that. So put twenty grand in cash and $23,000 in, uh, in a couple of Roth IRAs. And uh, maybe you go to the Bahamas with the other four or 5000 A down payment on a vacation cottage or a boat would be a swell idea. I'm just kidding. Don't do any of those things. But... Um, <laughs> It really just kind of depends on, yeah, you, know, you didn't tell us what you want the money for. I mean, pay off the house. I, I don't know. I like the down payment idea. So you use the money to get into more debt. Yeah. Yeah. Leverage. I mean, if, you, if you have $47,000 left on your house, maybe you pay your house off and be done with it. You know, there's um, an approach that we used in our office when I was a financial planner that we called the four cornerstones of your financial plan. And we'd start off with your financial position, which meant how's your cash flow looking? If your cash flow is not looking that great, then use it to augment your cash flow, meaning pay down debt, do the emergency fund, the stuff that OG talked about. If that's correct, the next part was your protection planning, making sure if anything goes wrong that you can kind of eliminate those possibilities. So if you don't have the right insurances in place, if you don't have the right, well, this is frankly where the emergency fund comes in, right, is is in the protection area and uh, getting all that stuff in order your estate plan as well, and then short-term and long-term goals. What are your short-term goals? What are your long-term goals? Start with the end in mind, figure out what those cost, and put enough money in the appropriate investment to reach the goal. And there you go. Bada-boom, bada-bing, OG. Okay. Next question comes Next. to us from Holly. Holly says, my daughter's opening a Roth IRA. She has about $2,500 in W-2 employment wages. Can she add to this year's Roth with babysitting and yard mowing money? I'd like her to reach 3000 so she can at least qualify for Admiral shares from Vanguard. It's so I funny. don't want to have anything other than Admiral funds because, God forbid, my internal expense ratio was 0.16 instead of 0.12. That's going to cost me four cents per thousand. Oh, my God, my retirement has collapsed. Help me. Help. My 16-year-old daughter will never retire because she has IVV instead of VTS. Ah! Sure. Absolutely. Make whatever number you want up for income. The reality is, is that there's no, well, assuming she had no taxes withheld from her paycheck, then you're not going to report her income anywhere. The kitty tax amount is whatever it is, 6,500 bucks or 7,000, somewhere in that range. So there is no place to put a child W-2 because ostensibly they're still filing on your tax return as a dependent. So, so you would go on your return, but you don't put it on there. So anyways, if she made $500 from babysitting money, absolutely. You have your $3,000. So does she get some, uh, does she keep a receipt? I mean, does she, is there any chance that she's going to have to show somebody that income? I can't imagine that ever happens, but sure. Write a receipt to your daughter that she provided $500 of babysitting. Yeah. I can't, I can't imagine it happening either, but there's probably a CPA out there that's like shaking and quivering. Like, Oh my God, that's terrible. Dina, you can call us and tell us exactly how to handle this <laughs> on Twitter. Please do. My unscientific answer is 
put 3000 into your mutual fund and have a good go at it. Let's have a discussion, OG, about something that drives me flipping crazy. And I understand, I understand that Vanguard's a good family. And we haven't talked about this in a while, but there has been so we're much. Lose half our audience right now, but that's okay. It doesn't flip and matter. All, we've talked. All two of them are going to go away. We've talked about this a lot. Fees are important. Managing your fees are important. It is not the reason why you're not going to get wealthy. I hate but to. Joe, it hate... tells me I, the internet says that if I'm paying more than point zero 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 one percent for anything, I'm being ripped off, and it's costing me seventy two days of financial independence per nanosecond. Three thousand dollars in a Vanguard five hundred Admiral share expense ratio point zero four. Uh huh. According to Morningstar, the average expense ratio in that category. 0.36. Let's do the math on $3,000. The fee is $1.20. $3,000 at 0.36. It's $10.80. So you paid between nine and 10 bucks of unnecessary expenses moving to the category average versus to Vanguard. Except you really didn't pay it because it comes out of the return. And so you would never know that you did that. No, but you did. Let's go back to this, though. If you can find me a person who didn't get wealthy because of the $10 of unnecessary expenses. And listen, I get it. If there's $10 of unnecessary expenses, don't pay it. Don't pay the 10 bucks. But the 10 bucks is not the dragon. The dragon is how many babysitting opportunities did your daughter pass up because she was playing Xbox? How much money could she have made that she didn't make? And I'm not talking about Holly's daughter here. I'm talking about the average person. Yeah. I have met so many broke professors who can do all the flipping math on fees. They can do tons of math on fees. How much money do you got? Well, <laughs> I'm getting ready to start. You know why you're losing? You're losing because you're not doing crap. You're not losing because of the fees. Fees are, don't, don't hear this the wrong way. Fees are an important thing. It's not your first dragon. Actually getting your ass out there and doing something is the first dragon. I feel like I instigated a little bit of this. So. You did, because I, before we started recording, you went off on a rant and, and I'm right there with you. It just, yeah. it's so flipping frustrating. And you know Why? It's easier for it's super easy for a blogger who doesn't know crap about crap to rail on fees. It's transparent. It is easy. It is an easy win. But there's the forest and there's the tree. And if you focus on the one tree that says, you know, what, I'm never going to have any good help in my corner. I'm not going to pay to have good help in my corner. I don't know anybody who's a multimillionaire that I ever worked with who didn't have great flipping people in their corner. My own brother, let me tell you a story right now that's happening in real time. My brother's going to be so pissed. <laughs> Talk about my brother instead. Change the name to protect the innocent. Okay. OG's, OG's bro brother. I, I was talking to OG's brother about this. <laughs> so OG's, OG's brother asked me a question about, uh, about his business. And he does this all the time. And I said, I don't know anything about your business. You know where a great place to look for this is? You should go to an industry conference. My brother, by the way, has been in business for a long time, and I continually tell him he needs to go to industry conferences. And he said, well, I knew you'd say that, but you're in finance where there's a lot of people that are all doing the same thing and they can collaborate and stuff. But in my business, you know, there's just one. Like we compete directly with each other. And I said, okay, but suppliers don't come there. Potential customers don't come there. People, people that are in synergistic industries don't come there. Like you don't have to talk to your exact competitor, but other people, I, the whole reason we get people on our show that we get is because of the fact that we know a lot of these people. The only way I got to know anybody was going to industry conferences. That was the only way. If, if there's one thing you ever do, it's network. The book, never eat alone. Just start there. And never stop networking. And networking face-to-face -face beats networking online any day. 
So I give my brother the same advice I always give him. And you know what he said? I'm sorry. I gave your brother the same advice I always give your brother. And you know what he said? I can't afford the $750 to go. And I want to throw my flipping device against the wall. He can't not afford to spend the 750 bucks. It's painful. You know, and what makes it, I think, even more is because you and I and and everybody has this. It's 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 not just in the financial planning space. It could also be if you're a physician. You know, I can only imagine what it must be like to sit with a patient and say, hey, uh, you should probably stop smoking. And they go, yeah, I'm not going to do that. And you're like, but it's killing you actually every second. Yeah, nah, I'm good. I, I always think it's funny when I'll, you know, I'll talk to somebody, you talked about being direct. One of the things that I might be, might be classified as being tolerably decent at is taking data and information and immediately like fast forwarding to the end. You know, that, uh, what was that pill that, uh, Bradley Cooper used to take oh, yeah, in, the, in that movie, you know, and, and everything was like, he's like, Ooh, look at me like that. Like, but I see this stuff all the time, you know, for 20 years, this is all I've done day in and day out. So you're unique, but you're not that unique. Like I've seen this story before and you go, okay, here's how we fix this. A, B, C, D. They go, yeah, I don't want to do A, B, and C. I just want to do D because that's the fun one. <sighs> but if you do D, then eventually you're going to end up blowing this up. And you're going to have to go back to A and B. Yeah, I don't want to do A and B. I, I don't oh, Okay. Y you know, and then you, and I get frustrated and this is one of the things that yeah, we were joking about yesterday. Joe, my, my biggest weakness is that I care too much. <laughs> <laughs> the best. And it's not a joke. I mean, I really do. And I get frustrated with, <laughs> with you know, <laughs> it's like the interview question, you know, the what's, best. what's your biggest weakness? I, I'm a perfectionist. Yeah. When you interview that, that LinkedIn person we were talking yeah, about earlier. Yeah, yeah. I'm a perfectionist. I care too much. Yes. So I, anyways, my, my be big... vulnerable, I guess. I think the message is be vulnerable be okay with not knowing everything. Be okay with done is better than perfect. I mean, in this example that what we started on with the whole, like, I got to get my Vanguard 0.04 fund instead of my 0.16. Well, if that's the thing, why aren't you using the Fidelity one that's free? Fidelity's got a free one. You will make way more progress in life. BlackRock IVV doesn't have the $3,000 minimum. Nope. Buy it 0.04. on. It's the exact same fee. Go buy it on M1. Actually, it probably doesn't have a commission, actually. Yeah. Go, go buy it on M1 Finance. Yeah. No commission. Yeah. Exact same fee. Why are we focused on this single thing? Thanks for the question. That was 26 minutes. I know. Everybody's like, I thought you were going to do letters today. Yeah. Oh, my brother's saying that to me. Your brother's saying that to me. <laughs> Made me so angry. Because that's. Yeah, your brother said some things to me, too. It's the one barrier he's always had. Yeah. is not knowing enough people. What's amazing is, is when he goes and he meets people, he's always like, oh, this person was so smart. They're so, but getting him to actually do that. And then he complains about the fact that he isn't where he wants to be. And then he says, I can't spend the $750 to get I to the place. I don't place. know how to make really good chocolate cake. You're like, here's the recipe. Not, I, that's way too much flour. What, do you want good chocolate cake or don't you? Because this is the recipe that produces good chocolate cake. Yeah, I'd have to go to the store. Oh, oh, holy hell. Like, did you say you wanted a good chocolate cake? You got to you put these it's two eggs. I want right. to put three eggs in. All right, OG and I got to go uh, refill our coffee before we just blow up spontaneously. <laughs> Here, wouldn't that be Maybe fabulous? We should have like be a fabulous you know, episode. Steve kaboom. puts in the sound effect right here of like a <laughs> nuclear explosion. <laughs> All right, Doug, uh, let, let's have a break for some trivia. Money nerds, I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. And I gotta bet that if you're a money nerd, you're probably nerds in other areas too, right? <laughs> of course you are. Joe's a board game nerd. OG's a, well, some kind of angry nerd. And, and me, I'm probably over-obsessed with looking good and sounding brilliant. But if you're a space nerd, we have some good news for you today. On this day in history in 1962, a man flew into space and became the first American to orbit the Earth. What is his name? I'll have your answer just after this. 
Thanks to Grammarly for supporting our podcast. You know, Grammarly <laughs> is pretty amazing and they know brilliance when they see it. I don't know if you know that, OG. Yes. You've told me about how uh, fantastic you're. I don't know if you knew that when you get the premium plan, they give you your stats once a week and it, uh, it just turns out, I don't know if I mentioned this, but I know, I know all the good words. I've got a good handle on all the words. 99% of them anyway. Great. Good. 99%. There's that 1% of words, but <laughs> come on. Grammarly is a communication tool that helps people improve their writing to be mistake free, clear, and effective. Start writing confidently by going to grammarly.com slash SB to get 20% off a Grammarly premium account today. By the way, you, you may not think that you need Grammarly. It's amazing how many mistakes you make in your daily writing. It also is amazing if you're somebody that generally doesn't write that well, how much people judge you based on your writing and is painful. You and I know a guy in business, OG, a number of years ago who used to, he had an assistant whose job was to help him before he sent out written stuff. And remember this particular guy, he would always send out these emails to people around him that were supposedly really professional that were just riddled with punctuation and grammatical errors. And it always underlined. You're talking about Doug, right? No, actually not in this case. I mean, the other guy. Uh, Me? It, <laughs> no, no. The other guy, guy we knew uh, who. The I, other other guy. Who I think went to Chicago. You know who I'm talking about? Did he go to Chicago? Bill Murray. Uh, no, but I bet Bill Murray uses Grammarly. Grammarly is a writing assistant to make you look and sound smarter. You can kick off the new year here by easily improving yourself and your communication at school, work, and almost anywhere with Grammarly. They help people show their best self through writing and are available across platforms, including online browser extensions, desktop editors, and mobile keyboard checkers. Grammarly is available on multiple browsers, Chrome, Firefox, Safari, Edge, and platforms, iOS, Android, Windows, and Mac. Their free product reviews, critical spelling and grammar, and the premium, which is what I have, looks out for spelling, grammar, plus advanced punctuation, structure, style within context, vocabulary suggestions, conciseness, and readability for different occasions, like business proposals, academic essays, casual blog posts, etc. Accomplish your goals with help from Grammarly. Stop making email typos on your phone. Close more deals at work this year with your emails. Polish your resume to get that job done. Head to Grammarly.com slash SB for 20% off your Grammarly premium account. That's Grammarly.com slash SB. 20% off your Grammarly premium account. How about that? Welcome back to Star Command, nerds. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and I'm orbiting the answer to today's trivia question. Before the break, I asked this. On today's date in 1962, who was the first American to fly into space and orbit the Earth? And because NASA kicked butt on that day, it wasn't just one orbit, not even just two orbits. This dude made three gigantic orbits around the Earth. How cool is that? The guy who did all that? Well, it was U.S. Marine Corps aviator, engineer, astronaut, businessman, and former U.S. Senator John Glenn. Talk about something that's an icebreaker at a party. That dude's got it easy. See ya! Hey, let's start with Haven Lifeline OG and tackle some of life's most important questions. Our friends at Haven Life Insurance Agency, they put what you value first. And we asked our friends on our Facebook page what two things they value by the way, if you want to hang out in the basement with us on Facebook, head to stackybenjamins.com forward slash basement. That'll give you the link. It's a, it's a pretty long link to get there. But Lindsay says, if family and time is the already allotted response, then it's our dogs and our Dungeons and Dragons party. There you go. What are you going to like better than your plus four sword and your cloak of invisibility? You got to have that. Lightning bolt. Lightning bolt. I tell people I'm wearing my cloak of invisibility when I'm at Kroger. I'm like, no, you can't see me. I'm just going to scoop by here. But you and, still have uh, to wear pants, though, just because. It is it is isn't just in case. Every system is a backup system. Just but, in case it doesn't work that day. Yeah. It actually is, as Lindsay knows, your family, <laughs> your family and your time. By the way, thanks for that, Lindsay. And that's why they've made buying quality term life insurance actually simple and fast. 
so you can spend more quality time with your loved ones. Head to stackybedjamins.com forward slash Haven Life now to get a free quote. The application is super simple and online, and you get an instant coverage decision. Prices are affordable, issued by the parent company Mass Mutual, more than 160 years old. You don't have to wait f- weeks for a decision. You'll get one quickly. You know what's what's funny is there was uh, a friend of ours, Nords, who – it's funny that Nords has never been on the show because he's commented a lot, and we've used stuff of his on the show, but we've never actually – had him on the show. I think it's because he lives in, in, in Hawaii. Most people don't know who the heck we're talking about, but anyway, Nords had a rant in a forum recently talking about how he went to get some estate planning work done and they keep having him fill out the same paper forms with all of this stuff that you could easily automate now. Right. Yeah. Companies like Haven life already know how to automate 99% of this. These attorneys are having you fill out this stuff. He goes, and then they're just, it's trees after trees after trees with sign here, sign here, sign here stickers. And he's really, there's this whole DocuSign thing that I could do that, that, that this could all be so much, so much easier. Had to go for this particular thing. Had to go to three different attorneys. And he said, it was just amazing how nobody, nobody got it. Yeah. I know the legal field in particular is uh, a little slow on the uh, digital revolution. Yeah, sure is. Uh, today, not slow, very fast, is our friend Jared. Let's throw out the lifeline to Jared. Hi, Joe and OG. It's Jared here. If you guys can't help me in your infinite wisdom, maybe Doug can. My Roth IRA investments are held in a Schwab brokerage account and are directed by an advisor from an independent investment firm. Over the course of the last five years, my 401k allocation and my wife's target date IRA have out-earned the Schwab account for the five-year and three-year returns by almost double, and they've lost less for the 2018 year-end and the fourth quarter of 2018. What action do you suggest as we pay approximately 1.5% to the advisor? Does the advisor stay or go? Excellent question, Jared, because uh, that last part where he said that in 2018, things got better at the end tells me a lot about what's going on with the allocation. But, uh, OG, what are you thinking? Well, you know, if the allocation is exactly the same, then I would uh, really wonder what the heck is going on. If you've got the same allocation in your 401k as you do in your Roth, and the performance has been that largely different, doubly different, then I think it's fair to have a conversation at that point and go, you know, how is this, how is this helping me any different than my, you know, than my uh, retirement plan? What you might find is that it might be a complementary allocation to what you already have in your 401k. So you might have in your 401k US large cap, and it just so happens that the last five years, that's been really good. And meanwhile, in your Roth IRA, maybe your advisor says, hey, you know, you don't have any exposure to international or small companies or emerging markets. So that's where we're going to put that. And of course, that's not done the same thing as uh, U.S. large cap. So I don't know that it's fair to compare apples to apples without looking at the uh, stuff. But if it is apples to apples, then you've got a justifiable uh, question, I think, with your investment advisor. If it's a complimentary allocation, I'd say that it's probably doing exactly what it should do. You've got one part of your account that's going up. You've got another part that's not going up as much. It'll rebalance. Yeah, I'm more worried about the fact that you don't know what's going on than I am about what's going on. Because if this uh, account lost less in 2018 than the other places, then there's a good chance that the advisor was taking a holistic approach and was making sure that you used the most effective things. And I'll tell you what would be proof of that, OG, is if the advisor helped you choose those investments in the 401k and in the other place that you mentioned. If those are independent and the advisor did nothing there, then I think we just we have a situation of assets being managed differently. Now, we look at the type of economy that we've had. We have had And I shouldn't actually even say economy, should I, OG? I should say market conditions, because there's a big difference between market conditions and what the economy's been. But market condition-wise, when you look at the last five years and the last three years, you're going to see things going to the moon. So something with a higher beta 
and a higher standard deviation generally is going to do better than something with a lower one. And it sounds like your advisor's funds are being managed more defensively than the other. So yeah. I don't think the question is, is the advisor doing a good job or a bad job when it comes to managing your money? I think question number one is, how is it being managed? And is it holistically being balanced against the money that's elsewhere? And if the advisor helped you pick everything together, was in on this holistically, then you should be high-fiving yourself that your advisor helped you pick stuff in one side that rocked and the three and five and helped you on the other make sure that you had uh, contrary investments. If you haven't had that discussion, then I think the types of things that we just talked about, about how these balance each other, is a conversation you should be having. And if you haven't had that, I'd be worried. Mm -hmm. All right, let's get back into the mailbag. Ginny writes, my husband has a man crush on OG. Ginny, your husband's not the only one. Just saying. Aside from that, my husband loves all things finance. He knows it. He's smart about spending and budgeting. The problem is that money talk bores me to tears, yet I know it's important to get a grasp on at least the basics. How can I become more interested in the topic of our finances? You know Ginny didn't even write that. You know Ginny's husband wrote that. There's no way Ginny wrote that. How how can I become more interested, person that doesn't listen to your show or know who the heck you are? Love, Ginny. Maybe he plays it through his Alexa speaker all the time. And she's like, I just got to, this is so boring. Every time they get in the car or better yet, it's like the, uh, the Dutch oven treatment where you hold their head under the covers and make them, make them listen to stacking Benjamins. Why you're such a romantic at heart. I didn't realize (laughs) it's amazing. (laughs) Oh, I know you play that game all the time. You Mrs. OG. No. I have nothing to say. I don't, I no I She listens to this stuff, dude. I can't, I got to be careful. I have an answer for this. I don't know how much of an answer you have for this. Try not do or do not. There is no try. I don't know. What's your answer? Well, my answer is it seems like people in finance always want to have the deep, meaningful discussion. And I think that obviously those are important to have. But that's why people are afraid of finance and absolutely hate it. They do. They think it's all deep and meaningful. And people don't want that on a daily basis. They want to have a little bit of fun. And so if you start with the, hey, OG, we got to have a serious discussion about our finances. Or I saw this great strategy about her. You're like, oh, no, please don't. Let me show you the uh, latest and greatest on financial. So I think keeping it light is important. I think making it more fun, having the more fun discussions And I think the more fun discussions are the aspirational ones. I think the ones about what are the cool things we want to do in the future? I think if you start with what are the cool things we want to do in the future instead of the goal. Now, if the cool thing is retire by age 32 and make your own furniture, your spouse might not be into that. I thought thought we were going past the rant stage. We're just, we're just going to circle right back. That wasn't a rant. I'm just saying I've met plenty of people who one yeah. person is like, let's do everything it takes. Let's eat rice and beans and get there right now. I'm talking about, you know. Yeah, you got to be on the same page. A train trip across the Canadian Rockies. Or Get on. <laughs> we want to. That's exactly the kind of stuff that Cheryl and I get excited about. But actually just even having the discussion about, hey, so what do we want to do in the rest of the time we're here? Like, what do we want to do? Mm-hmm. Part of the problem with finance geek versus non-finance geek is a finance geek looks at the numbers all the time and can kind of get the whole like compounding and that sort of stuff. One of the observations I've had after talking to hundreds of people every single year for the first time is when you drop that big number of like, Hey, great news. You need to get to three and a half million. And they're at three and a half thousand. (laughs) or or 35,000 or 350,000. Like that number seems so unrealistic. It just, it's so far out there. It's just like, yeah, okay, that's fine. And that's fine for the numbers geek to have the three and a half million dollar number. But I think you got to break that down into something that's a lot more relevant to today. And maybe that is, you know, hey, we're at 350 today. Listen, all we're trying to get to is 400 by the end of the year. 
however we get there, so be it. That's how we're trying to get, you know. So when we're talking about that together with the person who really cares about it and the person who cares very little about it, you can boil it down into one bullet point. We're trying to get to this. And if you get, if we can get to this, then we're on the track for the rest of the stuff without yeah, mucking it up with the rest of it. Yeah. Yeah. Breaking into those much smaller milestones. Speaking of that too, I also like breaking up those discussions into much smaller discussions. You know, Cheryl and I have a weekly financial meeting. Those sometimes don't go longer than 15 minutes. And I think, yeah, making, and you're not sitting at a boardroom table either dressed in a suit. This is something you're doing over a cup of coffee on a Saturday morning or on a run or something like that. It's very, it's yeah, structured yeah, because you've done a thousand of them, but it's unstructured in that it can happen at a grocery store. Generally with us, it's glass of wine Sunday afternoon. And it is, it is, like you said, super, super relaxed. And it's time now that we both look forward to. And what's funny is, is those small conversations lead to the bigger conversations. But I think that whole thing about, you know, us money geeks, we love the deep, meaningful conversation. And your average person is not, not into that. And I yep. think recognizing that's job number one. So Jenny's husband, who really wrote this on behalf of Jenny. Mm -hmm. Thanks for the question, Jenny. Next question comes to us from Chris. And I think, unfortunately, this is going to be our last one. Should I pay off my $28,000 car loan at 3.5%? I have $48,000 in savings. That holds my $20,000 emergency fund. I have a wedding to pay for, uh, estimate about twenty dollars to $25,000, not all at once, in October 2019. No revolving credit card debt. Roth 401k maxes out at the end of the year. 10% of each paycheck goes automatically to savings. Love the show, especially the roundtable episodes. Thanks for the question, Chris. Thanks for the kind words. Uh, what do you think? Get rid of the 3.5% loan? I don't think so. I think that uh, if, with $48,000 and you got a $20,000 emergency fund, so that's untouchable, and then you've got a $25,000 wedding to pay for in 10 months from now, also untouchable. How else would you pay for the wedding? You can't accumulate that money. Uh, I don't know what 10% of your income is, but why not instead of having, it seems like those two immediate goals are funded. So why have 10% of your paycheck go into savings? I take that 10% of your paycheck and put it on your, on your car note and pay down way faster. Or, or I'm going to give you another strategy because three and a half percent on a car loan, not egregious. I mean, it depends on your cash flow, but that interest rate, doesn't bother me a ton. What I think I might do was instead of paying that off quicker, make yourself a car note that goes into a savings account so that once this car loan is gone from now on, you pay cash for your car. Yeah. Whatever you're paying on your car payment, you have to continue to pay into another account from now until the end of time. Yeah. I might just make this car payment. It is what it is, but this is the last one. And then the second that 28000 is paid off, from now on, you're paying cash for your cars. Right. And that you do that by continuing the payments yes. that you have. Into yeah. Your, into your I would just take what you were saying, which I like, which is paying it toward the car. Instead, put that in a fund and just pay cash every, for the next one. Every day, just hate yourself a little, a little more so that you never do that again. I like it. Like, make the pain greater. <laughs> every time you look at that car, you go, man, I messed up having that car loan. What was yep. I thinking? Is that our, works well? Is that our last one? That's our last one. Thanks, for, sure? thanks for the questions, everybody. Yeah, look at the time. Thanks for the questions. We're so happy to take your questions. We uh, obviously got ranty today, which I think is something that people often enjoy. Not as much as we enjoy it. <laughs> Not. I think. I think we're ranty more. We just. Uh, that's just. We just don't actually hit record on a lot of those. <laughs> that is true. If you've got questions for us, head to stackybenjamins.com. At the top of the page, you'll see the questions for the show link. Click that button. And of course, the Haven Lifeline is the quicker way to get on these mailbag episodes. We've been told by Richie, our producer, that we have to have only about seven more of these and we'll be <laughs> cut up. So that'll be good. Lastly, if you're somebody ready to get started on your financial plan, OG and his firm are taking new clients, head to stackybedjamins.com forward slash OG, just the letters OG, that's stackybedjamins.com forward slash OG, and that's the first step toward developing your awesome financial planning team.
that's going to do it for today. Doug, take it from your man. What should we have learned today? Well, Joe, if they were paying attention, here's what they might have possibly learned today. First, when it comes to your financial planner, ask questions. If you don't understand what they're doing, the problem may not be performance, but communication. Having a team means being able to talk to each other. Second, are you investing? Well, if you are, stay diversified. Different investment categories move in different directions during different market cycles. Just because one investment category was great last year doesn't mean it's going to be the star this year. Check out this year's stock market performance versus last year for a case in point. But the big lesson? Yeah, let's not talk to Joe about fees anymore today. It looks like somebody might need a nap. Hey, big thanks to you for your questions today. Bring them on. I'll answer them all to myself the right way before handing them to Joe and OG to answer on the air. Want some of our incredibly comfortable and great looking swag? Call the Haven Lifeline. Stackingbenjamins.com forward slash voicemail is the place to leave your question for the show. This show was created by Joe Saul Cihai, produced by Richie Rutter Reese, and engineered by the amazing Steve Stewart. Online, visit us on Twitter at at SBenjamin'sCast or on our Facebook page. SB Podcasts may receive payment on the show from sponsors and guests in the form of books, giveaway items, discounts, or other remuneration. There's no way you would take advice from these dorks, but like Joe's mom always says, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only, and before making any financial moves, consult with a real financial advisor. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor Doug saying good night and good luck. This is the after show. Hold on. Part. I don't have to hold on. I will talk. All right, back project. What is happening? I'm I'm getting the, the trailer know. ready that we're going to play. I know play. how it works. Listen, you need to be better prepared. We leave you, you need alone to be prepared for, like me. We leave you alone for 20 seconds with a microphone. And uh and it goes it goes crazy. I'm surprised you weren't ranting. I left that to you today, but I just, it's kind of interesting how that transpired because I spent two days just in a tizzy with you on the phone and then, and then I, I shake it all off. All right, here we go. Ready to show up, show up for our listeners. And you're like, yeah, watch this. And I didn't realize I poked the bear so bad, but uh, anyway, thank you for being the bad cop. I'll be the good cop. Yeah. You know? Well, the good news is we don't need to talk about any of that because thank you, Jesus. I went to see a movie and without talking about the movie at first, I just love the range of movie theaters I get to go to now. <laughs> I get to choose between 20 movie theaters and it's amazing. Yeah. I can go to, and you can see almost any movie you want. I can see whatever. I, so if I see a bad one, it's uh it's on me this time and not up to the Cinemark for limiting it to Yogi bear three D <laughs> whatever, the, whatever the thing is. Uh, so Cheryl and I went out to a movie last week and we saw this movie starring, uh, Steve Coogan, John C. Riley called Stan and Ollie. Camera set. All right, back projection. Cue music. And action. Hollywood legends, Mr. Stan Laurel and Oliver Hardy arrived in Britain today as they embarked on a national tour. We're doing this while we're waiting for this new picture to come together. I'm going to make sure that this tour gets off on the right foot. There it is, the Eiffel Tower. <laughs> it's amazing that you two are still going strong, still using the same old material. 
Yeah. 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 Such a wonderful reception, isn't it, Ida? It's okay. <laughs> Two double acts for the price of one. <laughs> Pretty empty last night. I guess people just don't want to see Laurel and Hardy anymore. Has he been pushing you a little too hard, babe? You know, Stan. You could have said goodbye, Oliver, a long time ago. We had a good thing going, but you had this big chip on your shoulder because I did a picture with someone else. I couldn't sleep for days when they told me what you did. You're just a lazy ass. Got lucky because you met me. Lucky to spend my life with a man who hides behind his typewriter? You betrayed me. Betrayed our friendship. You're hollow. This is from the screenwriter who wrote uh, Philomena. Did you see Philomena? No, I did not. Excellent, excellent movie that I think you would have uh, liked. This movie is, as you just heard, about the early 1900s act Laurel and Hardy, uh, very famous comedians for people who don't know who they are. These are two people that uh, Paula Pant would have no idea who who they are. (laughs) I recognize the names, but I don't know anything about them. Uh, I didn't know anything about them either, except, of course, they're from the days of black and white pictures. Um, early Hollywood heroes, certainly Abbott and Costello followed up in their footsteps. So after many years of working, you heard they're at the end of their careers and they head off to Great Britain for a tour and nobody comes to see them. And uh, initially that is a huge problem. And it's a story about these two guys that have worked together for a long, long time and they have old grudges against each other. Uh, it's kind of the, the you can't live with them, but you can't live without them routine. And it's become painful and complicated how their relationship works. And this movie basically just follows that tour. And about halfway through the film, their spouses show up and uh, things things get a lot, lot worse once their spouses, spouses show. Because as, as you heard in that trailer, their spouses are both encouraging them to be angrier at each other which often happens, right? The tri- People come in on your side and they're like, well, that partner of yours is the problem. And so both of their spouses think that the other partner is... I was going to say, people say that to you all the time. <laughs> You've got Mrs. OG in your corner. You know what you could do without that, Joe? I know. It'd be so That's much right. better. We should just get rid of him. Yeah, and this uh, this happened there. So I generally don't like real-life stories. I got to tell you, this was such a good... This was such a good movie. I it, And you know what was great about it? Seeing two great actors like Steve Coogan and John C. Riley just being great at what they do. These two guys are just phenomenal actors. And it's funny because people see John C. Riley in all of those spoofs like, you know, Talladega Nights or in the new Holmes and Watson. I just, I just, I just listened to him yesterday in Wreck-It Ralph 2. <laughs> right. Right. You see him play those and you forget that he's been in some great dramatic roles. I mean, yeah. uh, Chicago won the Academy Award for best movie. He was in he was in that. He's been in so many great dramatic things. And uh, Steve Coogan also has been in so many great movies that that I've liked, uh, including The Trip, uh, which is a movie I don't think a lot of people saw. In fact, The Trip 2, probably fewer people saw, but was another was another fantastic movie. And Philomena, Steve Coogan was in that. So for anybody who likes just a good heartwarming story about two people who've known each other for a long time, their lives together and uh, kind of the the end of their careers and uh, realizing a lot about your life and why you do what you do. I think there's a, there's a great message. It, It definitely isn't a message movie, but there's a great message in the movie that I really appreciated. Huge thumbs up here. Not my favorite movie of all time. OG but a great use of two hours. Fantastic. Cool. Stan and I probably will not check it out, but okay. You should check it out on a plane. I think once again, it's a movie. Okay, maybe on a plane. It's a movie you won't watch, but you should. I'm glad you saw Black Klansman. I loved it. It's a great movie. Yeah, I was so happy because I didn't expect you to see that. So that was great. I'm a cultured man. (laughs) I wear sweater vests and stuff. If by cultured, you mean you've seen every Jason Statham movie. Then yes. Transporter 1, 2, and 3 were amazing. You are completely cultured. <laughs>